So if there's one thing you don't see that often in motorsport these days, it's utterly mental design concepts. The sort of thing you look at and think, how does that even work? Or what are you smoking if you think that's going to be competitive? The most recent example I can think of is the Nissan Delta Wing, designed by Ben Bowlby back in the 2000s. It was entered as part of Le Mans Garage 56 program, which is exclusively for acid trips like this. And at one point it was entered as a potential replacement for the Dallara IR05. And it actually raced, taking part in 29 races in the American Le Mans series, and was designed to reduce drag as much as possible. And it could still corner well, even with the wheels being that close to each other at the front. Now in 2023, the Garage 56 entry at Le Mans will be the NASCAR thing driven by Jensen Button, Jimmy Johnson and... Rockefeller? Is that the other guy? But either way, it's not as crazy as the Delta Wing. But back in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s, particularly in things like Formula One, these experimental cars were quite common. Not all of them worked, but they certainly gave it a red hot go. We've already talked about things like the gas turbine Lotus and the STP car that preceded it at Indianapolis. There's also the Lancia D50, which was the first car to have side pods. The Alpha 16 by Motori that had two engines in it. The Nardi 750 that had the driver sit on the right hand side of the car next to the engine, with the whole thing looking like it had come straight off the set of the Jetsons. And also things like the Tyrrell P34, the Chaparral 2J, the Brabham fan car, and the Lotus 56. Now, this isn't a complete list. I haven't forgotten anybody. This is just a selection. And experimentation hit a new level of crazy towards the end of the 1970s, when Lotus turned up to the Formula 1 World Championship with the 78, the first car to use ground effect. Now the whole story of how Chapman came up with that whole idea might be a good subject for a future video. Now ground effect is what the cars of today are using, and it's something Indy cars have used for a long time too. Air rushes through these massive tunnels on the underside of the car, and this creates negative pressure that sucks the car to the ground. It's a bit more advanced than that, but this is just Billy basic stuff. The closer to the ground the car is, the better the effect. And once the ground effect revolution started, the teams would add nylon side skirts to the edges to try and seal off the tunnels and give them even more grip. And the bigger the tunnels, the more air you can get in, and the bigger the effect is. That effect, called the Venturi effect, and the tunnels being called Venturi tunnels, lessened lap times and the FIA was looking at the cars and thinking, bloody hell, this can't go on much longer. When Lotus brought the 79 in 1978, the revolution had begun, but safety was still something the drivers were concerned about. The brakes weren't good enough for the shorter braking distances and the exhausts overheated. The cars were also cornering too fast for the aluminium cars to take and they needed stiffer materials. But if they did use stiffer materials, the cars then became too heavy. So in 1981, the FIA banned the side skirts and then mandated a minimum ride height of six centimeters, which is just under two and a half inches so that the cars would slow down. And it would also give the circuits time to catch up to the fact that these cars were just advancing far faster than they could keep up with and, well, just general safety in, well, general. That sun is really starting to annoy me too. So what do you do when something gets banned? You try and find a way of getting around that ban. It's like the man at the swimming pool saying no bombing and then when his back is turned, BOMB! Similar to how all the teams tried to find way of clawing back rear downforce after the double diffuser was banned. We ended up with the blown diffuser. And so on. Lotus already had something in the back they could take and work on. It was called the Lotus 88 and was never put into proper production because of the fact the skirts were doing a fantastic job. But it was there as an experiment to see if the concepts that they had dreamt up could ever be used. So when the skirt ban came into effect, Chapman had it pulled out of the shed and they started to work on it. The 88 being Lotus's car that had not one, but two chassis. 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 First off the bat, the car was the first, along with the McLaren MP4-1, to have a carbon fibre monocoque chassis, although the MP4-1 was the first to race. Because carbon fibre is a lot stiffer than aluminium, it means that the car was better under high G-load and lighter as well. Even if carbon fibre is many expensive. Has anyone here actually held something made out of carbon fibre? It's weird. And Lotus wasn't the only team to try and get around the banning of the skirts, because Brabham was using hydro pneumatic suspension to allow for the aero loads to push the car down below that 6cm limit on track. But Lotus was trying something different. You had the bottom part of the car, which was the monocoque, which contained the engine, gearbox, radiators and everything else, and then you had the top section, which was well, just the bodywork. 
The bodywork placed over the top dropped below the radiators to create the massive venturi tunnels required to produce all the downforce, and the entire bodywork shell that was the upper chassis was designed purely as one massive ground effect system. Its job was to produce downforce and do nothing else. Now the model I'm using here isn't an exact replica, but I hope it gives you at least some sort of illustration. So the TLDR of it all is the top half, the upper shell, whatever you want to call it, handled all the aero load and the bit at the bottom handled all the mechanical load. And then they sort of work together. What Lotus did with the upper chassis, which I guess is like the saucer section from the Enterprise D, is have that basically float on top of the main chassis with very stiff springs. The bottom chassis had softer springs, so that unlike the Brabham system, the drivers were a bit more comfortable. As far as I understand it, ground effect cars are more stiffly sprung than most other racing cars to maintain that stable ride height. As the car built up the downforce, the top chassis would be sucked down onto the bottom chassis, and ground effect gonna ground effect. The car turned up to the race at Long Beach and was black flagged and disqualified during the practice session, greatly infuriating Chapman. The FIA had declared the car legal, but the other teams had protested, saying that the whole thing constituted a movable aerodynamic device. Chapman boycotted the San Marino Grand Prix and then accused Jean-Marie Balestri of destroying the so-called pinnacle of motorsport, for which he was given a fine, but the fine was later rescinded after the other teams told Balestri that the fine was BS. In a video with Clive Chapman, Colin's son, he points out that inside the car is the sticker applied by the technical stewards at the British Grand Prix to say that the car was legal. Only for, you've guessed, Balestri to call the RAC and tell them that the car was not legal and should not be allowed on the grid and also threatened to make the race non-championship if Lotus was allowed to be there. Chapman had also been to the FIA's Court of Appeal in Paris to determine the legality of the car, and even went as far as to hire Richard Nixon's lawyer to try and get the car through. But it didn't work. The car is not a croc. There we go. Richard Nixon impression. The rule pointed to in the rulebook is still in effect today. Article 3.15 of the Technical Regulations, which I have quoted in other episodes of this series, and it's why the mass dampers on the Renault R26 were given the boot, as they too constituted a movable aerodynamic device. As the top chassis was independent of the bottom one, it violated the rules. I don't know what entirely sprung part of the car means, but I'm assuming it's the monocoque. If you work for an F1 team or understand the rule book better than I do, answers on a postcard please. The 88 was hastily repurposed to become the 87, and the team would finish a lowly 7th in the Constructors' Championship. For 1982, the 91 arrived, which would get them 5th in the Constructors, but it would also be the final time a Lotus would win a race before Chapman died of a heart attack in the December of 1982. So then, a look at the innovative and also controversial Lotus 88. If this has been something new for you, then do like the video so it can be sent through the YouTube sphere. And if you want to see more from the channel, subscribe if you're not already, and get the Jean Christophe belly on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks to the kind folk who support the channel via Patreon, and if you want to help out with buying images or just keeping things running around here, a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to my F1 store affiliate link, Discord, and my socials. Well, the super thanks if you just want to do a one-off hello. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.